if I were going to draw this and uh, I did not want to grid it, then I'm going to start, and I have had issues with this sometimes where I'll, I will start my main subject and then as I start adding the other things in the image, mm -hmm. I, I realize, oh shoot, I should have had more room on this side of my page. Well, then what I usually do is take out another piece of paper and tape it to the edge and keep going. So for me, my drawing is not just for my benefit. It's not necessarily ever going to be something that um, anyone else would want or see. Okay, so I usually start around the eyes and I'll try to draw a little darker so that everybody can see and then once I have that shape of the eye and I've kind of got an angle to it then I can start judging everything else off of it and this can take time to learn so um, it's because I've done enough drawing that I can basically measure with my eyes and it doesn't always work. There are times where something is off and I have to go back and um, look at it again to decide if, if I need to redo something. And I did on several of the bird drawings, the ink drawings that I did recently. And so then I would just keep going basically around the different shapes. And I'm not thinking of them as, okay, here's the beak. I'm thinking, okay, what's this shape? And it might be basically you could start with a triangle um, or you could just look at where the line comes in. So there's a, a, an angle and so I got that angle and then the side of the beak is right there. And then as I bring it out, it does have um, it has some feathers that sit over the back edge of his beak and it's got a little bit of a curve to it so I'm looking for the lights and darks and I put in my drawings for my watercolors I will note where the shadows are I will note where the highlights are just by drawing in those shapes and um, if you get a little confused like what what is that shape why did I draw that it might be that um, just putting a uh, a little dot on there so you could for your own benefit note okay so anytime I put a dot like there's a dot there there's a dot there those are going to be my blacks and so you could um, just and it could be different for each drawing but that will help give you something to um, remind you that there is a change of color or value in an area okay and then this one has shadows. He has shadows on his um, his head and some highlights. And so they're a little purpler in the shadow area. Let's see, that comes back here. So that again could be, um, if I wanted to remind myself, that's going to be a shadow. I could put a little X if I want to. Or sometimes I will put um, P for purple or, you know, and, and it doesn't always go on my painting. Um, Sometimes I will just mark it on the drawing and then any little um, changes in the feathers <coughs> as well. I will sometimes put those things in. Let's see, and then he has a swoop of a darker feather. So right here, actually let me zoom in because that will make it much easier to see. <coughs> I try not to blind guys. Okay. And I'll see if I can tip the photo up. Okay. So um, he has right here, his head edge matches this dark that comes down. So I'm, I'm always looking for those kinds of hints as well. So where, so where have, that um, piece comes down, then that helps me when I'm putting my, um, or doing my lines for the drawing, because then I know that that edge matches up and it's about right there and then the other thing you can do when you're drawing is you can help yourself by giving yourself clues so um, I can look at I can measure the size of the beak and then take that and that's one and a little less than two to the back of his back or I can take that same measurement and I can use it up toward his head. And so his up to the point of his 
um, feathers up there, that's two more beak sizes. And so I could use that same measurement to give me a mark that somewhere up here is going to be the back of his um, feathers up there. And I know I want it at an angle. So the other thing you can do is you can take your um, pencil and hold it at the same angle and then pick up your paper and lay it on there. And then that will help you see if you're getting the same angle. So you can use those kinds of things. So I'm not going to continue doing it this way, but I wanted to show you that um, basically there's tools you can use I to measure. I especially don't have an, Im an image, an issue with uh, when, you're, when you're first working on um, figuring out lines and working with a subject using tracing paper. And um, there were tools, there's, there's a lot of grief about, oh, you shouldn't trace and all of that, but when you are first figuring um, either a new subject out or you're, you're working on something and you want to get to the painting, to me, um, just using a piece of tracing paper is fine. Um, you are still training your eye to go, okay, I, I have to make this line at an angle this way and all of that. Um, and there were tools that the masters used that basically it was sort of like tracing anyway. So. Um, I do think that it is, once you can get away from that, it, you get a more natural looking drawing if you're not using um, the tracing method. And, um, you know, just, it's, it is what it is where you feel comfortable doing it. So the one thing to be careful with when, and I don't think I have a piece of tracing paper out here, but when you place a piece of tracing paper, it can, um, it's got just enough um, value to it that it's not clear and so you're not necessarily able to see some of the darker things in an image or some of the subtle things. So even though you trace it you should still take your tracing paper off, set your image beside it and look at it and go okay did I get that and what is that thing because some some images um, students will look at it and go, well, I don't know what that is. And I'm thinking, well, you need to look at your drawing or your, your image better um, and really figure out what those things are before you go to um, put it on your watercolor paper. Um, okay, so I will leave this out if anybody wants to see it because I, I think there's a lot of benefit to this book, even if it's not, uh, if I understood it correctly, even if he's not um, using the style anymore. Um, some of those uh, tools that he was using uh, can be really helpful to drawing birds. So um, it's, there's a lot of really interesting information in it. So I will leave that out. And then uh, I wanted to, I will start, let me move this stuff out of the way and remind me if I don't to get that to you, Judy. Um, oh, I forgot. These uh, are the book that I did the illustrations oh, for. Oh yes, how So if you guys want to oh, see it at all, I love this. so um, there's two. There's the uh, two versions of the hard copy, and this one has the um, the paper cover to it, so that you get the um, author and artist illust or um, illustrator's jacket on there. Sweet, sweet. Yeah, sweet. and then it it also is in the paperback version. So and I don't um, have one of those yet, but. Um, yeah, so they're available now, and Very I just sweet. thought it came out pretty good, so. The couple different ones, we started last week, Judy, by doing, we used a Pentel pen, mm -hmm. and that's what this um, chickadee is, and so everybody, um, I drew one did you get it drawn? Yeah. Okay, so uh, you guys are welcome to borrow these. There is a 0.3 and there's a 0.6, so one of them is a little darker, a little yeah. thicker, uh, ink and then when you get your um, the ink on there and don't feel like you have to cover it in completely because uh, the marks on here I made just enough marks that there was enough ink there yeah, to then right. give me that dark and then I used some of it to um, tone down in here mm -hmm. and same thing so we're going to start or I'm going to start with this one and you guys are welcome to be working on this one or this one and then we're going to move on so to this This guys. is a little bit different version, but this is a, um, a nut hatch. Mm -hmm. And I had drawn it, oh, I didn't bring my tape out here. I had drawn it in um, my gray 
uh, ink pen and the gray ink pen is waterproof but I want to um, use it for this so I will probably go back over it with a darker pen and this tape is not wanting to work with me. So what I'm going to do, because I drew my image up to the edge, except for right here, which that edge will be cut off eventually, mm -hmm. I'm going to tape it on the back. And this is a way that if you want to sort of stretch your paper, it's not really stretching it, but it's holding it, that you can do it and not tape it on the front. So if you curl the tape around, and I'm going to make two lines, just because this is a little narrower. This way, it will be attached to my board and it will help hold it when it gets wet. And depending on the paper you're using, some papers don't do well with tape, so by taping it on the back, it's a way that you can keep from possibly tearing yeah. the front. Yeah, so that now I can paint up to the edge on the front um, because my drawing was up to the edge. So generally though, when I'm doing a drawing for a painting, I have about at least a half an inch edge um, that is where I can tape or um, staple to, to do a painting. So um, I always allot for that with my drawing and that way um, I also draw the edge of my image, um, so I have a line always around my painting, oh. but I know this is where I'm painting too. And then if I have extra room, uh, depending on the size of the painting or the paper, I can use those edges to write notes to myself. So I will try colors on there, or I will um, put a note like this is the color I used, or this is the process. Um, and I just, so around a lot of my paintings, if you took them out of the frames, you'd see little notes. Okay, so if you have an edge on your paper, or if you're using a sketchbook, you may not be able to do this part of it. But if you have an edge, you could just tape it on the front if you want to. Um, and if you're using a sketchbook rather than a piece of paper that's separate, then um, you might just want to take a piece of tape and kind of tape it to a few of the pages around it just so that it will hold it a little bit because we're going to get a little wetter with this one in the beginning. So to do a, um, a wash where you're using random colors, there's different ways that you can do it. You could pour the paint on and tip it and let it move, but I'm going to have us do a quick version of that. We're going to get some color out and then we're going to let it move and bleed on the, on the paper itself. With, and we can apply it a couple ways. Um, and a lot of the time, to keep yourself from going, well, I, this bird is this color, I need to put that color right there. To keep yourself from doing that, I will um, actually do a pour or put random colors on the paper prior to doing my drawing because then I'm, I can't you know, get locked into, it has to be this color. So when I'm doing this, this bird may come out wild, but it's kind of the fun of doing it. So I am going to get out a yellow, a red, and a blue, and I'm going to let you guys pick which yellow, red, and blue I use. And that makes it even more fun because um, it will be random, not necessarily what I normally would choose. Okay, so which yellow should I use? Oh. So those four. This one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Coriolan. So what I would have. Which red from here to probably like there. Any of those. Okay. And then Which one is uh, this is Quinn Red. So Quinn Red, Oriolan Yellow, and um, from here to here, those. Um, not Thalo. These three or those three? Which blue and that one? Oh, well, okay. Getting out, I'm going to get out of uh, the colors and I want them to be pretty wet because I still want a lot of pigment. I don't necessarily need it to be too light, but I'm going to get out enough pigment and color 
that it can fill in a lot of this um, painting. And because I'm going to take that edge off, I don't need to do this, but it just will remind me that I'm going to remove it later, so I'll just take that there. And then I'm going to have this flat while I'm doing this because this um, kind of thing, I don't necessarily want all the color to pool down at the bottom. Red. So Quinn Red is um, a cooler red. It's not quite too pink, but um, it's, it's a very nice red. And I may have to get more out. It's wanting to stick to my brush. Some pigments will not release as well as others. And it can also depend upon your palette sometimes too. And then I will pull out some cobalt. And so with this mix, depending on how everything mixes together, I can get purples, I can get greens, I might end up with some grays or browns because it could, um, with all three colors mixing together, you can get um, a, a more neutral mix. Right. And I might also have oranges. And all right, so now I'm going to take my spray bottle and I'm not going to try to necessarily cover the whole page with water. With these guys. And um, I'm going to try to come at an angle, so hopefully I'm not going to spray you guys. And the angle, all it basically is doing is giving me some interesting edges. And if anyone needs to borrow a spray bottle, you're welcome to. It'll leave some openings, some whites, and so it's kind of fun to have that. And then I just want to put a little extra sort of in the middle because that will help the paint move when I go to put it down. And I'm going to start with the yellow and it's almost like close your eyes, don't look. Um, you want to just sort of get it on there without trying to place it. You're not trying to figure out, okay, the bird's head is here, I'm going to put it there, type of thing. Okay, and then do be careful if you're, depending on how you're, um, where you're working, you might end up needing some paper underneath it, so you're welcome to yell at me and I'll grab some, I have some newsprint we can put under it. And then also just watch your clothes so that you're not um, <laughs> splattering yourself. Now you can literally just tap your brush to the paper. You don't have to fling the paint. Um, but just be careful that when you're touching it, you're not stroking a whole lot. Because this is still, we're just wanting to put the paint on and let it do its thing. So right now we hope it's wet enough that when I finish up here, I can... Um, move the paint and get it to blend. Now the other way, like I said, would be to have little containers and pour the pigment on, um, but because that takes more time and I just want you guys to see this process because it might be something that you really like or it might be something that you're not really into and you don't want to spend a lot of time doing it. Okay. So I'm going to take some paper towels because I need to have a place in case it starts to run that I can let it drip into, like that. Okay. And if you are really doing pouring, pouring can be, um, can be layers and layers and using masking fluid to get um, some really interesting Sorry, probably hard to see. Okay, you can see it a little bit there. Um, to get some interesting um, values, so your mask, you would mask, and then you'd pour, and then you'd let it dry, and then you'd pour the next layer, and um, you'd get some really interesting um, layers and, and colors and all of that. There's a painting out there that um, has I did with 17 uh, layers on it. 
that was a oh. poured painting. Yeah. So this is just a, a mimic, basically, of that. I'm not liking this upper corner, so I'm going to spritz it just a little bit so that it will. I'm just doing the uh, Pentel um, bird, or if you want to start this, you can get that started. And once that's dry, I'll show you the next layer. OK. Seriously need an assistant. <laughs> just to remember to do all these things. OK, so. Um, I have the pouring done, I dried it, and, and then uh, you could have done your ink prior to pouring, but like I said, um, it helps if, oh, I forgot what I was going to use. It helps me not get too confined to certain colors have to go certain places if you do the drawing um, later. Now, mine does have a drawing on there because um, I didn't want to be taking the time to do that during class. And um, I don't know if you can probably not real well, but the nut hatch was on my phone, an image that I had on there. So I'm going to use the um, dip pin for this. I'm really liking the dip pin lately. And basically what I would do is, if I had done my pour and didn't have my drawing on there, I probably would come in with a pencil and pencil in the lines. But since I already have, um, my drawing on there, I'm going to go over it with uh, the ink now. And I'm still trying to um, look at my image when I'm doing this because I have found that I see things uh, that maybe I didn't catch the first time. And so is, if your pencil line is light enough, you can make adjustments to your drawing when you're putting the ink on. And I'm going to give it some lines here and there. And I really am just enjoying the, the dip pen lately because one, it has very nice dark ink, but um, I can get really nice thick and thin lines with it too. What size of a nib is that? I unfortunately don't know because these were my grandpa's. Oh. Yeah. He had a box of them, and when um, we cleaned out the house, may say in here, um, I grabbed them. So, looks like it says a number eight. Huh. Yeah. Bell System. Um, he was, he did contracting, uh, was a contractor up in Denver and worked on some of the buildings up in Denver. So, I do not know exactly what. Now, because this um, bird is missing the highlight in his eye, I'm going to uh, make sure I put one in. And I don't think there is a specific, it always goes at the back of the eye or any of that. It really just kind of depends on where the light is coming from. Um, so I would just, if you don't see one, just kind of make your best estimate and go with it. Okay, and then I'm putting a few, I think you guys can see that, putting a few marks around his eye for feathers that would be there. For this guy, I may not do any like filling in of the dark area. Um, I did on this version, so I had filled in the darks there and then made the marks around his head. But this one I thought I, I would play with the colors that are... Um, on the paper from the pour. And so I'm just going to do a touch more here, and then I will show you the next step. Okay, so I would get um, all of that <coughs> done, inked in, whether I was filling things in or not, if you're filling them in and making marks. and But I'm, I would fill in all of that, and then move And I found, for this pen at least, that I can usually just clean it with my towel and it's clean enough. I don't have to uh, use anything else to clean it. Um, so once you have your ink on there and you've got it the way you want it, then I would, I do not remember exactly what um, colors I used to make this, but I think I had 
I want to say probably Cobalt or Ultramarine and maybe, um, I'm going to say New Gamboge because it looks like a warmer yellow. And so I'll go ahead and use that. So I'm going to use uh, the same red I have out even though I probably had a different red out. And I would take some of that color and I'm going to try to make a kind of a muted burgundy-ish color for the tree and you can leave parts of it but that is working with the same color now as it comes into the yellow I'm going to go more into the the yellow to sort of mimic my wash that was there And then it's a little bluer here, so I'm not cleaning my brush, but I'm just going into, because I want it to be sort of a neutral um, kind of blend of colors anyway. Um, and so that already starts to make the tree come out. And you can leave some of the earlier pi pigment um, layer showing through. And then um, I think I'll put a little color on the bird to give the bird some form. So I can put some water up in here. And so now at this point I'm not using a photo. I'm just working with what I have. But if you have a photo in front of you, you could use that to help you see where the values are. Um, you could also change your photo to black and white so that you're not looking at the actual color of the bird, but you are looking at um, the, the values to help you uh, know where you want to use the colors that you've used for your pour, if that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> I think I want to put some orange and yellow together, or red and yellow together for a little bit of an orange look down here. And this will make the bird look kind of unusual because this is not the normal color of a nuthatch, but um, it just, I think they're really interesting. They're a fun way to do um, a little more of an abstract looking bird. And I don't want that line that I ran over the edge of my lighter part of the bird there. And then his beak would be dark. So I'll make a purple and then grab just a touch of the yellow to go a little darker. And I think I'd probably leave it just like that and not, you could, you could play with the background too if you want to, but it's really sort of about adding just a little more color, uh, um, a little more layering. You could, depending on your um, bird and how your colors came out, maybe you don't want to use exactly what was um, the first layer in an area. Maybe you want to use the same colors but go with something that um, just layers over the top of it. Um, so if you had yellow down below and you layered some purple over it, then that's going to make a different look. Um, but so there's, there's, there's that bird, there's the globe. <laughs> I can't talk right now. Um, so I would, I would leave that one and then um, I'll let you guys go back to work on yours. And if we get time, we'll talk about these guys and we get going on them. And, and I am not going to rush this. So if we don't get time to finish these today, um, I'll, you know, maybe start one of them and then we'll finish next time and start the Blue Jay, but we'll see where everybody's at. So while the students went back to work on their pieces, I continue to work on the nut hatch, and I am adding more of the ink lines to the bird, and I am looking for the places that will help describe either the feathers or uh, some of the changes from darks to lights or color changes. And my drawing was already on my paper under the wash of color that I put on, so I am going back over some of those lines, but I'm also adjusting some of the lines uh, here and there 
because I uh, was looking up the photo again and saw things a little differently. At this point, I'm not adding uh, any uh, cross hatching or um, value change uh, by texturing with the ink pen, and I'm using a dip pen with um, waterproof uh, black ink. And I'm just getting the bird in still. Right now, the, the background wash of watercolor is um, very colorful and textured because of the, the uh, light um, parts of the paper that are showing through. Some of the longer feathers right there, I'm using the pen to make those strokes and make it look like the feathers are kind of wispy. I'm getting the feet in and then I rotated my board because it's easier to draw sometimes with your board or your paper uh, in the direction that you're working and um, now I'm going to start adding in some of the bark on the tree that the bird was on and in this case I'm giving an idea of the bark it's not exactly every mark that is on on the image but it just is uh, kind of random and giving it texture And then I started putting in some of the um, evergreen uh, needles that were in the background and just trying to get some of those in in the ink. Finishing that section up. And then it is a good idea to give your ink a few minutes to dry, even if it's a waterproof ink. You don't necessarily want to start putting paint on it right away. Okay, so now my paint is dry and I am using Burnt Sienna and Ultramarine Blue to create a brown that I go over the bark of the tree trunk with. And it looks kind of dark when I initially put it on, but watercolor dries 20 to 30% lighter than what you put it on as and so it will dry lighter and you'll be able to see the ink through that watercolor. And then that has to dry so while that's drying I go and start adding some color. I'm still using the Burnt Sienna and Ultramarine Blue but I made it a little grayer this time so it has more blue in the mix. And this won't be quite dark enough for the bird. I will eventually go back and put some more color on the bird a little bit of color around the face and I don't necessarily want to get rid of all the color that I put down for that first wash where it's just really random colors I want some of that to show through so I'll, you'll see it on the birds uh, head and a little bit on some of the feathers here and there and then I left some of it on the bark of the tree uh, that color right there is soda light and it's a, a color by Daniel Smith and it's a very nice black um, and now I think I was using a uh, quinacrinone burnt sienna for some of the rusty color that was under the bird. This next section I'm going to add some color to the uh, background so I wanted to use kind of a olivey green for some of the pine needles and some of that background color so I wet the paper first and then I'm using ultramarine blue and new gamboge and I'm changing it so sometimes it's a little yellower sometimes it's a little more blue and um, mo moving my brush in the marks of uh, something that would look like pine needles and leaving some openings here and there so it's uh, a little kind of mimicking the marks of maybe a uh, pine pine tree with maybe some openings. Now once I got that background on the tree trunk was not dark enough anymore it was uh, blending too closely with the background so I went to the tree itself and I started adding in a few marks here and there. I just had to stay away from the edge that was near the green of the other side so that those two wouldn't blur into each other. And now those areas are all dry and I've gone back with my ink pen and I'm adding texture to the bird's head and I added some more value to the beak so it would be a little darker. 
and then I decided to add a little bit of some cross hatching or some hatching to the feathers of the bird to give it a little bit uh, more value and, and texture and also to the tail. So now because I did that darker uh, value up on the bird's head, the white of the cheek and the, the head of the bird are really standing out, even though it's got color on it. Now I'm wetting the tree trunk and I'm going to darken the edge that's near um, nearest to the bird and that background color so that those two, the tree and the background color will separate more. And then I just let it blur to the right because I, it has water on it. So I didn't have to put color everywhere. And then I went in and put a little bit of gray on the bird's feet because they were looking a little pale. And I then used that same gray burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to add some color to a few places on the bird's feathers so that he would also become a little darker. And the last uh, little part here, I used ultramarine blue and some new gamboge to create some more pine needles. And some of those pine needles, I am following my lines of the ink pen that I had put down earlier. And some of them I'm just making strokes on the paper so that it adds depth because you've got more layers. And this is the final image where you get some of that background color peeking through and it becomes a very unique uh, ink and watercolor wash. Thanks for following. See you at the next class. Bye.